mathematical modeling is the prerequisite for any theoretical or computational analysis of a flow problem. So we would first have a look at the mathematical modeling of flow problems in this module. We would specifically have a look at the basic conservational laws of physics. Next, we will have a look at the notations which we employ in mathemat and mathematical analysis of flow problems. Then we will have a look at derivation of governing equations of the flow problem. The next lecture will focus on mathematical classification of the governing equations of the fluid flow. And in the last lecture in this module, we will have a look at boundary conditions for flow problems. Let us first start with the first lecture in this module, which is conservation laws and mathematical notations and some theorems which we would need to derive the basic governing equations of the flow problems. The outline of this lecture would be, we will first have a look at the basic conservation laws of fluid mechanics, then mathematical notations which we adopt in writing the fluid mechanical equations. Then we would look at few theorems which we would use in the derivation of the governing equations, specifically changing from one form to another, namely Gauss divergence theorem and Reynolds transport theorem. First, what are conser conservation laws of physics? The fundamental conservation laws of any medium, whether it is fluid or solid, it remains the same. It is a basic conservation law of mechanics and these are the conservation of mass. For any system in, no, in a non-relativistic framework, the mass of the system remains constant. So that will be your the first law which we would use to derive an appropriate governing equations for a flow problem. The next basic law is the conservation of momentum, which is essentially equivalent to the Newton's second law of motion, which would be the most important law in the fluid flow. The next one would be conservation of energy. Again, in a non-relativistic framework, this is essentially the first law of thermodynamics. Now these laws, they are not sufficient by themselves. They require certain supplementary equations. They are referred to as constitutive equations. For instance, we would need equations to relate stress and strain rate tensor in the fluid mechanic problems and stress and strain relation for a solid mechanics problem. Similarly, for diffusion of a species or a scalar transport, we would need something equivalent to Fick's law or Fourier's law. Then we would also need equation of the state specifically for compressible fluid flow. Next, let us have a look at the mathematical notation which we commonly use in fluid dynamics, specifically in computational fluid dynamics, because the conservation law they will involve scalar quantities, for example, temperature, pressure and density, vector quantities, for example, velocity and forces, and tensor quantities like stress tensor. The commonly used notations in CFD are dyadic or vector notation, expanded or component form or Cartesian tensor notation. Now these are notations which are preferred by the fluid mechanicists or the engineers. There is eight another notation which is commonly used in research literature that is common uh, by mathematicians. They do not make any difference whatsoever with regard to the quantities involved. All the quantities are treated as if they are a tensor of a specific order and the context would make it clear whether we are referring to a tensor of order 0 that is a scalar a tensor of order 1 that is a vector quantity or a tensor of order 2 that is a second order tensor. But engineers they prefer to adopt different notations for different quantities so that equations become very clear at the first glance. So let us have these three notations which are used by the engineers or physicists in fluid dynamics one by one. Let us first have a look at what we call dyadic notation. This is also referred to as the vector notation. In dyadic notation, we would use normal type phase for scalar quantities. For example, temperature would be denoted by simple italics T, pressure by P, density by rho, and so on. For a vector or a tensor quantity, we would use a bold phase type in the printed material, and in handwritten material, we would use normally an arrow mark or underbars to denote the tensors of different order. For example, velocity vector would be denoted by simply bold V and stress tensor by a bold tau or a bold capital T. Now what are the advantages of a direct notation? The advantages are we get a very compact form. For example, for Newton's second law of motion, in the vector form we would simply write it f is equal to ma, whereas if you were supposed to write it in the component form, we would need three separate equations, fx is equal to max, fy is equal to may, and fz is equal to maz if we have chosen a Cartesian reference frame. 
Whereas in the case of direct notation, we just need to write a single simple equation f is equal to ma, which clearly tells us that it is not dependent on the coordinate. So that is why this direct notation is also referred to as coordinate free form. And the physical meaning of terms is very clear. The capital bold F indicates it is a force and m simple without bold it says it is a simple scalar quantity mass and bold A that denotes it is vector quantity acceleration. So the physical meaning of the terms in equation written in direct or vector notation is very clear. But what are disadvantages? The algebraic manipulations are pretty difficult. We have to remember various different formulae to manipulate the equations written in vector or tensor form. Ordering of terms is very important. For example, if you have two tensor quantities A and B, A dot B that is dot product of A and B is not the same as B dot A. So the order of terms is very, very important when we write in direct notations and we have to be very careful in manipulating the equations written in direct or vector notation. The next form is our expanded form which would depend on the choice of the coordinate system. That is to say whether we have chosen a Cartesian reference frame or a polar co cylindrical polar coordinate system or a spherical polar coordinate system. The equations are detailed and they are cumbersome to write. At the same time, algebraic manipulations are very easy to perform as each term in the equation represents a scalar quantity and order of terms in a particular equation they are not really important. And for final numerical discretization or computer programming, we would actually write all the flow equations in expanded form. The last one which we will have a look at is what we call Cartesian tensor notation. This is primarily used in manipulation of the different equations or schematic representation of different algorithms. Let us have a look at one quantity. For instance, if you have chosen a Cartesian coordinate system, velocity vector v would be represented by three Cartesian components u, v and w, where i, j and k, they denote the unit vectors in x, y and z directions. Now this could also be written equivalently as v1 i1 plus v2 i2 plus v3 i3, whereas i1 represents the unit vector i that is unit vector in x direction, i2 represents the unit vector in y direction and i3 represents the unit vector in z direction. So in fact, in Cartesian tensor notation, we would represent our coordinate system O x y z as O x1, x2 and x3. And how would we represent a particular quantity? We would use k subscript to represent a tensor of order k. So if we want to represent a scalar quantity, there is no subscript required, simple italic symbol would do. If you want to represent a vector quantity, we will use one subscript, for instance, V subscript i that denotes the ve velocity vector. Similarly, two subscripts, they would denote a second order tensor. For instance, tau subscript ij indicates a tau is a tensor of order 2. The advantages of the Cartesian tensor notation is we get the compactness of the vector or direct notation and details and ease of manipulation of a Cartesian component notation since all the terms in a Cartesian tensor notation, they are scalar quantities. So we can easily manipulate like person written in Cartesian tensor notation. Now there are certain conventions which we need to be aware of when we want to use Cartesian tensor notation. And the very first one is what we call summation convention, which is primarily first started off with Einstein. So it is also known as Einstein's summation convention. So whenever we have a repeated index in a term, it implies summation over the range of that index, which is 3 in a 3 dimensional space. Similarly, if you are dealing with n dimensional vector space, the indices will run from i is equal to 1 to n. So in, if you write, for example, a i b i, this would represent the sum over in i, a i b i. So in fact, a i b i, it represents the dot product of two vectors a and b. Similarly, del v i over del x i, this represents the summation over i of del v i over del x i, that is del v 1 by del x 1 plus del v 2 by del x 2 plus del v 3 by del x 3 in three dimensional Cartesian space. We would frequently need a specific tensor quantity which is called Kronecker delta in our manipulations. So Kronecker delta is a second order isotropic tensor which is defined as delta i j is equal to 1 if indices i and j are equal and it is equal to 0 if i and j are not equal. 
This particular tensor has got a specific property which is called substitution property of Kronecker delta that is if delta ij uj this is equal to ui that is the subscript j has been replaced or substituted by the index i. <coughs> the next important tensor quantity which is used in Cartesian tensor notation is alternating tensor or permutation symbol which is a third order isotropic tensor which is defined as epsilon i j k is equal to plus 1 if i j k is equal to 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1 or 3, 1, 2 that is indices i, j and k follow a cyclic order and it is equal to 0 if any two indices are equal. It is equal to minus 1 if the indices i, j, k they follow the anti-cyclic order that is i, j, k is equal to 3, 2, 1, comma 2, 1, 3 or 1, 3, 2. This alternating tensor we will primarily need in the cross product of vectors. Now, let us have a look at different products which we can form with two vectors a and b and how do we represent them in Cartesian tensor notation. Suppose let us deal with first with a scalar or dot product in this case the order of terms is not very important. So, a dot b is equal to b dot a which is equal to a 1 b 1 plus a 2 b 2 plus a 3 b 3 which we can compactly write as a i b i in our Cartesian tensor notation. Vector product c is equal to a cross b this is written in our Cartesian tensor notation as C i is equal to epsilon i j k a j b k where C i represents the ith component of vector C and a j and b k are corresponding components of vectors a and b respectively or and epsilon i j k is our permutation tensor. Similarly, we can also form a tensor product of two vectors. For instance, if you have got two vectors a and b capital C is equal to a b this we can write in initial notation as c i j is equal to a i b j. We would very often use a differential operator which is called del operator and it is defined as del is equal to i del by del x plus j del over del y plus k del over del w where i j and k these are unit vectors in the Cartesian x, y and z directions respectively. In initial notations or Cartesian tensor notation we can write it i subscript i del over del x i. Now, this di uh, difference operator can be used to form both a dot product or it can be applied directly to a, a scalar quantity or any tensor quantity. For instance, if we take dot product of this del operator with a vector v, so del dot v this is equivalent to del v i divided by del x i or in expanded form it equates to del v 1 over del x 1 plus del v 2 by del x 2 plus del v 3 by del x 3 where v 1, v 2 and v 3 are the components of vector v in x 1, x 2 and x 3 directions respectively. And now, this operator when it is, it is applied to a vector v it leads to a tensor quantity which we call gradient of a vector. For instance, del v subscript i j this is equal to del v i over del x j. Now, please note that we have uh, when it is operated on a vector quantity this gradient operator gives us a tensor of second order. Similarly, if we take divergence of a second order tensor divergence of tau for instance divergence of tau we will give us a vector whose ith component will be given by del tau ij over del xj and please remember here summation is implied over the index j. So, if you look at these two equations which on this slide which we can clearly observe is the divergence operator decreases the order of the tensor by 1 whereas the gradient operator increases the order of the tensor by 1. Now, in CFT we would need differential as well as integral forms of the governing equations. In the derivation of these equations we will come across volume integrals as well as surface integrals. So, we would need certain mathematical tools so that we can transform the integrals in one form to the integrals in another form. For instance, we would very often require transformation of a volume integral into a surface integral. Now, Gauss divergence theorem helps us in this respect and what is this theorem? Let us say that we have got let us denote by omega a volume of a continuum medium bounded by a closed surface A and let q x be any scalar vector or tensor field. Gauss divergence theorem states that 
the volume integral of del q over del xi that is equal to the surface integral of q. In particular, if q were a vector, then Gauss divergence theorem becomes the divergence of q is equal to q dot a surface integral over a or we can write this as del qi over del xi d omega is equal to integral over d a, uh, d a i q i. So, we can clearly say that right hand side of this equation represents the dot product of vector q with the area vector a. Now, this theorem can be used to change the integ volume integral to surface integral or vice versa. Another theorem which you would need is what is referred to as Reynolds transport theorem. What is the use of this particular theorem? The conservation laws of uh, mechanics they are defined for a system that is a control mass or a closed system whose mass remains constant. In fluid mechanics though we would prefer what is referred to as Eulerian description in which we focus on a fixed volume in a space that fixed volume is commonly referred to as control volume. Now how do we derive the basic laws with reference to this control volume? Because the basic equations or the fundamental conservation laws they are applicable to a system. So Reynolds transport theorem helps us in this task and it is essentially a version of what we call Leibniz theorem in mathematics. So let us have a look at Reynolds transport theorem. We will differentiate between two terms here intensive property and extensive property. For any given quantity small phi, its extensive property is defined as the in volume integral of phi multiplied by rho d omega or the small phi essentially represents the capital phi per unit mass. So once you have got uh, the, this relation between the intrinsic variable small phi and its extensive counterpart capital phi, we can now write Reynolds transport theorem as a d capital phi over dt that is time derivative of capital phi with respect to time for the control mass. This is equal to del by del t of volume integral over Cv rho small phi d omega plus the surface integral with respect to surface of the control volume rho phi v minus vc dot dA. Now here vc represents the absolute velocity of the control volume or control volume might be moving. Now in essence what this theorem states is that look rate of change of capital phi for a system this is sum of two components that is rate of change of phi in a control volume which we also refer to as temporal derivative plus the net flux of phi through the control surfaces. Now the second term on the right hand side is also referred to as the convective term. We would use Reynolds transport theorem to obtain the governing equations for the fluid flow for an Eulerian control volume. Now let us start off with the very first conservation equation that is mass conservation. In a non-relativistic framework, this, the mass of a system is always fixed. Hence, the time derivative of the mass for any system is 0. That is dm by dt cm is equal to 0. Now this mass capital M could be defined as integral over the volume omega rho into 1 d omega. So thus we can identify the intrinsic quantity linked with mass is the density rho. Hence, in Reynolds transport theorem we can put small phi is equal to 1 and thereby we can obtain the integral form of the mass conservation equation which is also referred to as continuity equation as the temporal derivative of integral rho d omega plus the surface integral of rho v dot dA is equal to 0. So the very first term tells us that volume integral of the density and its temporal derivative plus the flux of the density multiplier velocity that has to be 0. Now this form is referred to as the integral form of the continuity equation. We can apply the Gauss divergence theorem and thereby we can change this integral equation into a differential equation. So let us first take the case of a fixed control volume that is a control volume which does not change with respect to time. So in that case in the first term the del by del t this operator can be taken inside our integral operator. So the first term of the continuity equation becomes 
integral over C V del rho by del t plus for the second term which is a surface integral we can apply the Gauss divergence theorem and thereby we could obtain divergence of rho v d omega integrated over control volume this is equal to 0. We can combine both of these two terms together and thereby we can get this simple integral equation that is the integral over the control volume of del rho by del t plus divergence of rho v this should be equal to 0. Now this particular equation it holds for any control volume that is to say our choice of the control volume was arbitrary and this integral is equal to 0. It is only possible if the integrand is 0 everywhere. So that is why this integral equation leads us to this particular differential equation that is del rho by del t plus divergence of rho v is equal to 0. Now this is referred to as the differential form of continuity equation. Now differential form of continuity equation contains two terms that is first one is the derivative of density with respect to time and the second term is divergence of rho v. Now these two terms their summation should be 0 everywhere. Now we can write this equation in Cartesian component form as del rho by del t plus del of del x of rho u plus del of del y of rho v plus del of rho w over del z that is equal to 0. We can also write this equation or continuity equation in Cartesian tensor notation as del rho by del t plus del of rho ui over del xi where ui denotes our velocity vector. Our next equation will be momentum equation for which we will start from the Newton's second law. The Newton's second law of motion says the time rate of change of momentum of a system that should be equal to the resultant force applied on the system where this P represents the linear momentum which can be defined for a system as an integral rho v d omega over the control volume. And now in this case let us identify what would be the extensive property and what would be the intensive property for use in Reynolds transport theorem. Clearly from this integral we can see this capital P or the <coughs> linear momentum which is our extensive quantity and rho into v which is what we had in our definition of extensive property, this V gives us an intensive property for linear momentum. So thus we have got small phi is equal to V and if we put small phi is equal to V in the Reynolds transport theorem, we can obtain a very simple relation that D capital P over DT for a control mass system that is time rate of change of momentum for a control mass system that is equal to del over del T of the volume integral over the control volume of rho v d omega plus the surface integral over the control surface of rho v v dot d i and this would be equal to f r. The first term refers to that is del by del t of rho v integrated over the control volume. This gives us rate of change of the momentum in the control volume and the second term that is surface integral of rho v v d i this gives us the rate of efflux of linear momentum across the control surface. Now please note this V V, this is not a simple dot product of two vectors. In fact V V, V is a vector, hence V V denotes a second order tensor. So what we have got here is rho is a scalar quantity, V V becomes a second order tensor. So we have got the scalar dot product of the second order tensor V V by our area vector d a. Now let us have a look at the resultant force for any control volume. The resultant force can be expressed as sum of the surface and body forces that is F r is equal to F subscript S plus F subscript B where subscript S refers to the surface force and B refers to the body force. Now the surface force can be obtained if we knew what would be the stress acting on the surface. So if our stress were tau which acts on differential element dA the dot product of tau with dA would give us the differential force acting on that particular elemental surface area. This we can integrate over the surface of the control volume to get the net resultant surface force. Similarly, the total body force can be obtained if we knew the body force per unit mass that is B, rho B, d omega integrated over omega that will give us the total body force. 
Now this body force normally arises because of let us say gravitational attraction or electromagnetic field or similar long range forces, whereas the surface forces they arise from the contact with different medium or solid boundaries. Now we can substitute this expanded form or these integrals for the resultant force Fr in the pre equation which we obtained in the last slide and thereby we would obtain the integral form momentum equation as del by del T of surface sorry volume integral rho V d omega plus the surface integral rho V V dot d A that is equal to surface integral of tau dot d A plus the volume integral rho V d omega. So, this is our integral form of the momentum equation. Now, this integral form can be converted into a differential equation by again using Gauss divergence theorem and in this case what we need to do is first we will change the order of differentiation and integration here by assuming C big to be a constant control volume that is a constant control volume which does not change with time. So, this particular term will lead us to volume integral of del rho v by del, del t d omega plus this surface integral can be changed into a volume integral using Gauss divergence theorem. This would become volume integral of divergence of rho v v d omega. Similarly, this uh, surface integral tau dot d a becomes volume integral of divergence of tau d omega. This again a volume integral. Now, all of these terms then they have been transformed into volume integral. We can take them on one side and we can write them as a simple volume integral and again we can argue the right hand side has become 0 and that can be true only if the integral vanish, integrand vanishes at every point and that argument leads us to our differential form of momentum equation that is del rho v over del t plus divergence of rho v v is equal to divergence of tau plus rho v. Now, this particular equation was first derived by the French mathematician Cauchy. So, this is referred to as Cauchy's equation of motion. Now, this is equation of motion in the vector form. We can write it in Cartesian tensor notation as del by del t of rho v i plus del over del x of rho v i v j. This is equal to del tau i j over del x j plus rho v i. Expanded form of uh, momentum equation could be obtained in different coordinate systems. Now, please note that this particular form we call as conservative form. What do you mean by conservative form? Here each term in differential equation of a conservation equation is either a time derivative, divergence or gradient of a function. So, if you look carefully here, the first term is a time derivative, the second term is a divergence of rho v v. The next term that is the first term on right hand side, this is divergence of the stress tensor this surface sorry this volume component B or the body force B, it can be represented by a gradient of some scalar quantity. So, this is again representable as a gradient. So, this particular form of the momentum equation is referred to as the conservative form of momentum equation. Now, we can change it using the change uh, chain rule of differentiation and continuity equation. We can obtain the non-conservative form of momentum equation which is given by rho del v by del t plus v dot del v that is equal to divergence of tau plus rho v. The right hand side has remained the same, only changes have been in the left hand side. If you closely observe this left hand side, the del v by del t, this refers to the local change in the velocity vector that is local acceleration, v dot del v, this is referred to as a convective acceleration. So, this whole term in the bracket, this is essentially the acceleration term. So, rho into acceleration that is equal to divergence of tau plus rho into v. So, this is a conservative non-conservative form of momentum equation. In CFD, we primarily focus on the conservative form momentum equation. Now, if you look at the momentum equation carefully, we would see one thing very clearly that this vector equation is essentially a system of three equations and how many unknowns we have got? the number of rho would be an unknown, velocity vector is unknown that is to say we have got three unknowns here and we have got a tensor quantity here, second order tensor tau, now tau would have nine components. 
So you've got more number of unknowns than the number of equations. Total number of equations are three only. For rho, of course, we can get continuity equations. So we get four equations. Four equations for nine plus four, 13 unknowns. So there's something missing. The system of equations is still not complete and it cannot be used for the mathematical solution of equations. So we need what we call constitutive models for relating the stress tensor to velocity components. Rather, we would try to relate the stress tensor to rate of stress tensor in the fluid dynamics. Now, the simplest model is the linear relationship between stress and strain rate. This is used for Newtonian or stochastic fluids. For non-Newtonian fluids, stress to strain relationship is non-linear and there are different forms of the non-linear laws which are available which can be substituted in momentum equation to simplify it further. Now, let us have a look at this constitutive relationship. For a general fluid, the stress tensor tau can be a function of the strain rate tensor S, where S is given by half gradient of V plus gradient of V transpose. So, this S represents the strain rate tensor and a general dependence could be written as a tau is a, a function of S, derivative of S, the second derivative of S and so on. Now, the presence of these time derivatives that would be uh, would take care of the different types of fluids. For instance, if we had a second order fluid with memory, which is also referred to as a viscoelastic fluid, in that case, the dependence would be only on the stress strain rate tensor S and its time derivative. That is, tau would be written as minus P capital I, where this I is RNT matrix, a scalar quantity alpha 1, alpha 1 multiplied by the stress rate tensor S plus alpha 2 times S square plus alpha 3 times S dot. Now, alpha 1, alpha 2 and alpha 3, these represent the typical material properties which would be determined empirically by performing experiments for a particular fluid. For a Newtonian fluid, the dependence is very simple. We have got tau which is a linear function of S and in this case, we can use some simple algebraic manipulations to arrive at a very straightforward form for the stress tensor. That is tau is given by minus p subscript i plus lambda times divergence of v capital I plus mu time twice of mu times s. Now, here this uh, coefficients lambda and mu, they are referred to as coefficients of viscosity. Lambda is called the first coefficient of viscosity and mu is referred to as the second coefficient of viscosity or dynamic viscosity. P is also referred to as thermodynamic pressure. Now, we have got two unknowns in the previous relations lambda and mu. We would like to simplify it further. So, for this Stokes came with a hypothesis that for majority of fluids, there is a relationship that is 3 lambda plus 2 mu is equal to 0. In fact, the 3 lambda plus 2 mu, it is related to what we call the bulk modulus of a fluid. So, Stokes hypothesized that this particular combination is equal to 0 and this leads to a very simple form for the momentum equations which is referred to as Navier Stokes equations. Now, these equations were derived separately at different points of time by Frenchman Navier and the Britishman Stokes. So, they are referred to uh, jointly by as Navier Stokes equations. And we can write in dyadic form as del of rho v by del t plus divergence of rho v v is equal to rho into v minus gradient of p plus 2 times divergence of within the brackets mu multiplied by s minus 1 by 3 divergence of v multiplied by iron t tensor. Now, this equation holds good irrespective of whether the fluid is compressible or incompressible. That is to say, whether its density is constant or variable. Now, in case the fluid density were constant, that is to say, rho is not a function of time or spatial coordinates, then this Navier-Stokes equation can be further simplified. And the simplified form Navier-Stokes equation can be written as del rho by del t plus divergence of v v is equal to minus 1 by rho gradient of p plus nu times del square b plus v. Now, please note these two equations, they are written in vector form and they can be applied to any coordinate system.
But when we want to discretize these equations for CFD analysis, we will have to write these equations in appropriate reference frame which we have chosen. We can choose either a Cartesian reference frame or a cylindrical polar coordinate system or a spherical polar coordinate system or a curvilinear system and we have to write the expanded form of either of these two equations separately for each choice of the reference frame. The next would be how do we obtain the conservation for an arbitrary scalar quantity. For instance, if we had a generic scalar or an arbitrary scalar phi, a transport equation for this generic equation can be written by look, looking at our momentum equation. That is, we should have a time derivative term, then we should have what we call a convective term on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we will have a diffusive term and a term which is contributed by something similar to a body force terms. Now, this has been derived or written in analogy with our momentum equation, where we had a time derivative term, a convective term, a surface integral of the effects on the surface plus whatever effect we can obtain from the body or volumes generation. So, this is our generic transport equation for a scalar quantity phi. This equation for a scalar quantity phi can also be transformed into a differential equation by using the same logic that is we transform first each of these surface integrals using Gauss divergence theorem. For instance, this particular term surface integral of rho phi v d a, this would become volume integral of divergence of rho phi v. Similarly, this, this uh, surface integral gamma gradient of phi would become divergence of gamma gradient of phi d omega. So, both of these can be transformed into volume integrals. We can transfer all of these terms on the right hand side combined together in a single volume integral that is that will read as volume integral of del rho phi by del t plus divergence of rho phi v plus within bracket minus divergence of gamma gradient of phi minus rho q phi d omega. And the right hand side of this integral is equal to 0 which can happen only if the integrand vanishes identically at every point and that leads us to differential form of generic transport equation given by del over del t of rho phi plus divergence of rho phi v which is equal to minus gradient of sorry divergence of gamma gradient of phi plus q phi. Now, we can write this vector equation for generic transport equation uh, in indicial notation as del by del t of rho phi plus del over del x j of rho phi v j which is equal to del over del x j of gamma del phi over del x j plus q phi. Now, here this gamma represents a sort of a diffusion coefficient or diffusivity, q phi represents a volumetric generation term. The next conservation equation is that of the energy conservation and uh, the integral form of energy equation can be easily written from our thermodynamics. If a small e denotes a specific energy that is energy per unit mass, then del over del t of rho e d omega that is the volume integral of this energy and its time rate of change plus rho e v d a its surface integral this will give us the efflux of energy. So, rate of energy generation in the control volume plus the efflux of the energy that should be equal to the total amount of energy which is supplied from the external sources the, which could be due to the transfer of heat from the surface or volumetric heat generation given by capital Q or the generation of heat because of the flow of a viscous fluid. So, we have got a few terms here. The first one refers to the time rate of change of specific energy in the control volume. The second one refers to the efflux of the energy from the control volume across the control surface. The first term on the right hand side that tells us the volumetric heat generation. The next term tells us the heat diffusion across the surface and the last term tells us 
the generation of heat because of the viscous dissipation. Now, once again this integral equation we can transform into a differential equation. We need to keep doing this because this integral forms would be used for one particular methodology which we call control volume approach whereas for finite difference method or for finite element method we need a differential forms of the governing equations. So, let us interchange the terms here that is let us interchange the differentiation and the integration. So, this term will become integral over the control volume of del rho e by del t. The next term which is a surface integral we can transform using Gauss divergence theorem into a volume integral as divergence of rho e v d omega. The next term this is already a volume integral. This, this surface integral can be again transformed into a volume integral as divergence of q d omega. The next one can be written as divergence of v dot sigma d omega. We can combine these two in a single integral equation. <coughs> All the terms are transferred on the left hand side and the right hand side of the integral equation will get 0. And then we can again use the logic that an integral volume integral can vanish only if the integrand is identically 0 everywhere in the volume and thereby we get a simple differential form for energy equation. And this is our conservative form of uh, energy equation del rho e by del t plus divergence of rho e v is equal to capital Q minus divergence of Q plus divergence of V dot sigma, <coughs> where sigma is the viscous component of the stress tensor. Now, this is conservative form of equation because this the first term is a time derivative, the second term is a divergence of something, the third term is a constant function, this term is a divergence of a flux and the last term again is a divergence. So, all the terms are expressed in the form of either a time derivative or divergence of some quantity. So, that is why we referred this particular form as a conservative form of energy equation. Now, left hand side can be further simplified. We can use the chain rule of differentiation. This term can be written as del rho by del t into E plus rho times del E by del t. Similarly, this term can also be broken into two parts by using chain rule of differentiation. We can combine this, these two terms, make use of continuity equation and some of the terms will vanish del by del, del rho by del t into E, that term will vanish and we get the so called non conservative form of energy equation given by rho del E by del t plus V dot del E is equal to Q minus divergence of Q plus divergence of V dot sigma. So, this is our non conservative form of energy equation. But let us make it very clear that most of the time specifically in finite volume formulations and finite element formulations, we would use the conservative form of energy equation. The equations we have, we have derived so far, they hold good for any fluid, whether the fluid is compressible, irrespective of the fluid density, fluid velocity and so on. We can derive different simplified forms. For instance, all the flow equations can be written in a much simpler form if we assume the fluid to be fluid is com may be compressible, but the flow can be assumed to be incompressible. This can happen if the Mach number of the flow is less than 0.3. When the Mach number is less than 0.3, in that case compressibility effects can be neglected and even for a working fluid like air or similar gases, the equations uh, in all the equations which we had, the continuity equation, momentum equation or energy equation, density can be assumed to be constant which will lead to simpler forms of continuity momentum and energy equations. Similarly, in certain situations, the viscosity of the fluid can be assumed to be very small. This happens at high speed aerospace flows where the velocities are very high and we can neglect the contribution of the viscosity to, to the stress tensor and this simplified form is referred to as Euler's equation. It and the simplified form could be if we assume the fluid to be inviscid, that is we can neglect the viscosity of the fluid as well as any rotationality effect present. So, in this case we need to only worry about a single scalar equation in terms of a uh, scalar velocity potential and this scalar velocity potential is referred to as uh, this particular equation Laplace equation for scalar velocity potential is called as potential flow equation. So, these are few simple forms, further simplified forms could be obtained for low Reynolds number flows in which case 
we can neglect the time derivative term and this leads to what we call the creeping flow. In this case, our non-linear inertial terms on the left hand side of moment e equation they vanish, so we get a linear equation. Similarly, for buoyancy driven convective flows, we can use what we call Bogin approximation, thereby we can assume density to be constant in continuity equation, in energy equation as well as in momentum equation and we will only incorporate a small change which reflects the effect of buoyancy in the body forces. So, there are various other simplified forms which are possible and which are utilized in approximation of different flow problems. So, that is where we would stop 